deep in the Herefordshire countryside, eight winding miles or more from the nearest town and close to the border with Wales, there's a small miracle, nine centuries old, waiting for anyone to enjoy who seeks it out. You approach by a quiet lane, which is in fact the street of a deserted village. Cows grazing among the earthworks. You encounter a Norman church, little altered, and beyond it, the modern earthworks of a castle. Just fragments of its stone keep remaining. You are here, as a helpful signboard explains in Kilpeck. Ruined castle, deserted village, Norman church. And from the Mott you can see all around. This was the headquarters of one of the smaller marcher lordships the barons who controlled the borderlands and acted as the buffer between warring England and Wales. Hugh of Kilpeck, Hugh the Forester, was lord of this domain in the anarchy period of the 12th century. Like his neighbours, he was a warlord, but he must also have been a man of exceptional culture, a connoisseur who used his wealth to employ artists and craftsmen of the highest calibre. And here is his art gallery, Kilpeck Church. Is there another humble village church anywhere that can boast an entrance like this? Just look at the exquisite craftsmanship. Almost perfectly preserved foliage and monsters, grotesque heads and forked tails, conjured from stone of delicate pink. Boring nights battle it out with sword and axe, while behind them serpents twist and writhe. Above them a basilisk faces off a lion. Then the cavalcade of grotesque figures draws the eye up to an angel who presides over the whole performance, surrounded by his strange fantastical menagerie of beasts and birds. Then the green man. And below him, more serpents and much stylized foliage. as we look down sheltering a pair of doves at the foot. Above the ancient door, the tree of life is lapped by the river of living water. All is richly imbued with deep symbolic meaning, derived from that ancient textbook of religious zoology and fantasy known as the Bestiary. For Kilpeck is the finest achievement that survives of the Herefordshire School of Romanesque Sculpture craftsmen of the of the highest order who drew their inspiration from right across the Norman world and its antecedents and who laboured through tumultuous decades of 
of civil war in the 12th century to, to beautify their cathedral in Hereford and the little churches of its precarious diocese. Come inside and, and there is more. A perfect Norman interior focused on the vaulted apse which protects the most precious possession of a medieval church, the altar where mass was celebrated, the mystery of flesh and blood, bread and wine. The sculptors have been at work here too, and around the chancel arch. Up both the jams are saints, three on each side, one above the other. St Peter is obviously one of them, because he's carrying a very large key. The gates of heaven must have had a substantial lock. The saints opposite have droopy moustaches, and in the words of a professor who has written extensively about Kilpeck, generally glum expressions, which is typical of the Herefordshire sculptors. Not much fun being a saint, evidently. The fun, in fact, is mostly outside the church, just below the roof. Kilpeck's corbels are famous. A few are missing or damaged, but they carry on right around the church. And much of human, much of human life is here. They range from the obscene, the female exhibitionist or Sheila a gig, to the alarming, a beast devouring a human head, to the cartoon figures of a pig and rabbit and dog, a kind of medieval grommet. There are salutary warnings. Too much loud music can lead to unwanted amorous advances. Get off me. Best to keep your legs firmly crossed. Round we go. Beasts and faces. More from the bestiary. Caricatures of real people, perhaps. Hugh of Kilpeck's friends immortalised in stone. Time has vanquished all the inhabitants of this sequestered place. All their cottages are long gone, just mounds in a closer pasture. Hugh's castle is down, jagged fragments only of the crumbled masonry. But their church has survived, and with it their way of life, their fears, their labours, their pastimes, their sins, and a view of the world around them which is part religion, part tradition, part fear, part dark magic.